Hi friends, welcome back. I'm gonna be sad when these chapters are over. There are, there are, I believe, 22 of them and we're on 17. But it's been fun going through them with you. Uh, again, if you're just joining us, where you been? <laughs> Uh, we're reading through Letters from Backstage, uh, the book that I wrote about my time on the road. Uh, but I very much suggest you start with the first video, which I'm sure you have. Okay. Rest of you guys, veterans, pull, a pull up a chair, pour a cocktail, draw a bath, whatever you do. Um, this is Chapter 17, My Broadway Adventure. November 2nd, 2003. Friends, as we move our show from city to city... I find that more and more, I'm choosing to forego air travel in favor of driving with castmates. There's something great about throwing the luggage in the car, leaving whenever you want, taking your time, and watching the scenery go by. It gives you more of a sense of getting from here to there. Sure, flying is quicker, but doing it every week wears thin. All those airports with their crowds, noise, bad art, fake air, high security, harried airline workers, and of course, fluorescent lights. You know how I hate those. Compared with that mechanical glass and steel atmosphere, a trip down a highway is like getting back to nature. And so, instead of flying from Springfield to West Point, I shared the 15-hour drive with my very talented castmate, Shahara Ray. She's the head whore in the show, and proud of it. Shahara and I had worked together years ago at the Lawrence Welk Dinner Theater in Escondido, California. Believe me, I could do a whole chapter on the Welk with its champagne glass fountain in the lobby and the fake bandstand where you can have your photo taken next to a cutout of Lawrence Welk. But so as not to get too sidetracked, I'll, I'll just give you this quick glimpse. The theater is part of a retirement village. This is the Lawrence Welk. Uh, the theater is part of a retirement village. Before the show... The ancient residents are fed a nice meal, then they're bussed down the hill to the theater where they settle into their soft, comfy seats. The lights go out, the overture begins, the curtain comes up, and you guessed it, <laughs> everyone goes to sleep. The guys in the pit used to hold up signs for our benefit that read, sing and dance and hurry. Performers who have trod the boards at the Welk share a special bond. It's an experience. Anyway. Les Mis was a surprise reunion for me and Shahara. So off we motored in Shahara's bright orange SUV, stopping at some truly weird truck stops, an enormous video arcade, and most of the Cracker Barrels uh, restaurants along the way. It was during one of these stops that my agent Eric called me on the cell phone. Some of you may remember Eric. You may also remember that whenever, whenever he says, now here's something interesting, a new twist is about to follow. The last time I heard that phrase, he was about to tell me I'd been offered Les Miserables. Now here's something interesting. But first of all, where are you? Hell, I don't know, a gas station somewhere between Springfield, Illinois and West Point, New York. I, I could find out the exact town if it's important. Why? Well, they want to see you this week for hairspray for the Harvey Firestein role. Can you make it? I laughed. The drag role? Well, yes, apparently they've heard about your legs. Well... Sure, I guess I can get there. How did this happen? Darling, you have me as your agent. That's how. Well, why not? I hadn't planned on visiting Manhattan, but who am I to say no when Broadway calls? It was Monday. The audition was on Friday. There were details to coordinate and not a moment to lose. I swung into action. First question, what to sing to audition for the role of an overworked, overweight, Baltimore housewife and mother who turns into a stylish, sassy diva. There is an art to selecting the perfect audition piece, and clever choices are often highly guarded secrets among the musical theater actors. Shahar and I brainstormed as we whizzed down the nondescript freeway. I called my pal Patrick in, back in L.A. for his input as well. Patrick has a knack for such things. We all finally hit upon the perfect choice. I'm a little proud of this one, musical theater folks. Uh, a song from Pippin called Kind of Woman. I'm your average, ordinary kind of woman, practical as salt, modest to a fault, conservative with a budget, liberal with a meal, just your average ideal. Stop looking, said Patrick. That's the one. The next call was to my subletter in L.A. who found the song in my files 
don't ask, I have sheet music for all occasions, and faxed it to our next th theater, while Agent Eric faxed the scenes I needed to learn. That was back before we all had computers and email and that kind of thing. Uh, so they faxed everything. Um, other details would have to wait until I got to West Point. Everything was in motion, words and images flying through the air, and it all happened as we zipped along, the wonders of modern technology. <laughs> These drives are always longer than you think they're going to be, especially if you stop at a huge video arcade to kill some aliens. Well, they had to be killed. They, the entire universe was in danger, and we were the only ones who could save it. And so, long after nightfall, we were still traveling. By now, the highway was covered with a thin layer of dangerous black ice. And from time to time, we'd see vehicles off to the side of the road, some of them overturned. I fought hard against sleep as we continued at a painstakingly cautious speed, our eyes glued to the road. As co-pilot, it was my job to alert Shahara whenever I spotted a shining patch so she could slow down even more. Bridges were the iciest. We crept across them at a snail's pace. Then, sometime after midnight, it happened. The SUV hit a slick and started skating around. Okay, 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 here we go. Okay, I chanted, holding on tightly while Shahara, suddenly very calm, deftly executed a textbook perfect response, turning into the curve and tapping the brakes until we spun to a stop against the center divider. The road was dark. Everything was covered in snow. We were still upright. We were fine. We both exhaled hard. Then Shahara turned back onto the road and off we went. Neither of us was the least bit sleepy after that. We pulled into West Point at 3 a.m., bleary-eyed, shot, and no longer making any sense. I believe we were able to mutter our names to the front desk clerk, though the process of checking in seemed confusing and foreign at the time. The hotel, a rambling intersection of hallways built on an incline, was among the ugliest I'd seen in my entire tour of the great and not-so-great hotels of America. It didn't matter. Not at 3 a.m., and not a week away from Boston. We were in terrific spirits and looking forward to five weeks in Beantown. And meanwhile, here we were in beautiful West Point, where the fall leaves were even more outrageous than they'd been in Springfield. Here they were not only amber and tan and tangerine, but also fuchsia and aubergine and flam flaming orange and flamingo pink and deep brown all mixed together. Our odd hotel had, among its good points, a Denny's and a weird but great Greek diner across the street. Hallelujah. We were bused daily to the theater, which was on the campus of the United States Military Academy at West Point. All in all, not too shabby. Our company managers had warned us to plan for major, intense, time-consuming security inspections. And so on opening night, we left the hotel early enough to allow for lengthy delays at the gate. We pulled up to the guard shack, our IDs out, curious to see what this inspection process would be like, bracing ourselves to make the best of it. This kid with a rifle steps onto the bus and asks, you guys the actors? Yes. Okay, have a great show. And with that, he steps off and waves us through. We felt so violated. Every city's audience has its own personality. The cadet-heavy crowd at West Point was, well, not our liveliest. That's because cadets are trained to do things as a unit, in a focused, disciplined manner. Spontaneous, wildly hysterical expressions of emotion aren't really part of the whole cadet thing. And so, as an audience, they subconsciously organized themselves. All applause was in unison. It lasted for a suitable duration, then ended abruptly. If one stopped, they all stopped. When there was a humorous moment on stage, they responded with no more and no less than the appropriate amount of laughter. A chuckle immediately followed by silence so that the presentation could continue. To make matters worse, the seats, were, the seats in the theater were gray and so were the cadets' uniforms. So in the half darkness, not only did the house sound nearly empty, it looked that way too. And so went our opening night. 
Between scenes, I continued to plan my Manhattan detour. I decided to be smart and ask for Thursday night off so I'd be settled and rested for my Friday audition. The stage manager granted my request. I'd emailed my friends Jeff and Chris, whom I'd stayed with during rehearsals for the producers, who once again offered shelter to their friend, the wayward actor. Since much of the cast lives in Manhattan, and since it was only a 40-minute drive, lots of people were commuting, and I easily arranged a ride. I'd leave Wednesday night after the show, spend all of Thursday in the city, audition Friday, ride back up with my fellow actors, and do the show on Friday night. Music, lodging, transportation, schedule, all coordinated as the turntable revolved and the French citizens revolted. Before I knew it, the show was over, and it was time to accept our audience's measured, restrained applause. Backstage, we have a blue cue light that signals the cast to return for a second curtain call. Up until West Point, we've been cued back out at every single performance. But here, for the first time, the blue light stayed off. That's because the applause had ended. The cadets had expressed their gratitude for what seemed an appropriate duration. Perhaps there's a chapter on the subject somewhere in one of their training manuals, and then stopped. Clipped and clean and never lavish. Eyes front, soldier, you're in the army now. I was reminded of a story my friend Joy Todd tells about a bawdy, ballsy, stand-up comedian she used to know who lived next door to a very mousy little old lady. Oh, I just love to come see you perform sometime, said the sweet old thing. Oh, honey, are you sure, said the comedian. My act's a little racy. Oh, I don't mind. Well, the night came, and after the show, they met backstage. Well, said the comedian, fearing she'd shocked her elderly, elderly neighbor. What'd you think? Did you like it? Like it? Oh, my dear, it was all I could do to keep from laughing. Wednesday night, I arrived at the theater with all my clothing and music for the big day. We left right after the show, and about an hour after the curtain came down in West Point, I was walking into Jeff and Chris's apartment in Manhattan. They were waiting up, of course, hungry for all the tour dish. It was a lot like those early weeks of rehearsals for the producers when I'd stumble home after dancing for eight hours and recount the highlights of the day, acting out everything in their living room. How things have changed since then. Now I'm on my second big show, breezing into town by request, like a Broadway hotshot, to audition for my third. Who am I all of a sudden? Thursday, after the guys went to work, I rehearsed my song, I worked on my audition materials, and walked around my beloved hometown. I had exciting plans that night. In the midst of all the other preparations, I'd arranged a ticket to see my wonderful friend Stephanie Block, who plays Liza Minnelli opposite Hugh Jackman in The Boy From Oz. I am so very proud of her, and I couldn't wait to see her in her first Broadway show. Meanwhile, my former producer's castmate, Fred Applegate, was currently starring in the Broadway company of that show. I told you about that. Uh, Fred and I had been the two Max understudies on the road, so there was a bond. I surprised him with a call, and we made plans to meet for dinner. Hours later, we sat at Barrymore's, the legendary Broadway hangout, catching up. Fred, I said when I finished eating, I want to see that marquee with your name above the title. So we strolled over to the St. James Theater, and as we turned the corner, I stopped. My jaw dropped open. It really was a fantastic thing to see my theater pal's name up, up in lights, every actor's dream. Oh, Fred, I gushed. That's amazing. And Fred, who is by nature stoic, solid, and underplayed. Fred, who barely bats an eye at even the most shocking news, turned a merry shade of pink and giggled. I have to say, he confessed sheepishly. It's pretty cool. We headed backstage where I saw several former castmates, laughs and hugs all around. Moments later, I was lounging in the star dressing room, who am I all of a sudden, with the friends on Broadway, when who should walk in but Stadlin himself, our former Max, for a surprise visit. All three Maxes in the same room. They teased me for leaving the producers, and I teased them about having to work so much harder than I do, and we laughed and we reminisced, and then it was 7.30. Time to go see Stephanie in her Broadway debut. I left the St. James, I dashed over to the Imperial. Moments later, I sat shifting in my seat as I waited for the show to start. Like a proud parent, I told all my neighbors that my friend was playing Liza Minnelli and, and they got excited too. New York theater goers are the best. They like to share the experience with each other. 
And later during the show, the woman next to me gave me a nudge and a wink as if to say, hey, she's good. <laughs> and she was. She's fantastic. Stephanie is always great, but this was far, on, far above and way beyond. To see her in her red sequin mini dress, surrounded by dancing boys, wowing a Broadway audience was really something. I recalled that when we worked together, our pre-show mantra was kill the people, kill them dead. Well, she killed them. Stone cold dead, blood in the aisles, not a soul breathing. When I went backstage after the show, I was without words for a minute. Yeah, I know. Me, can you imagine? So we just stood there grinning at each other and laughing. It's quite something to see your colleagues starring on Broadway. After I left Stephanie, I headed back over to have post-show drinks with my producer's pals as I waited outside the stage door. Out from the theater swept none other than Mel Brooks and Anne Bancroft. I waved sheepishly, not knowing if they'd remember me. Kostroff! Mel demanded as he grabbed my arm and slapped my cheek. We gotta get you back in the show. We miss you in the show. Well, Mel, offer the lead is what I wish I had said. I believe what I actually said was, I, we, well, I just, thanks, because I'm sure I'll, or something of an equally eloquent nature. The ever elegant Ms. Bancroft smiled warmly and with perhaps a touch of pity at my incoherent babbling as they climbed into their limo. And then they were gone, leaving me standing there stunned beneath the blinking marquee lights. Do I know Mel Brooks? Jeez, look at me, Mr. Broadway. Friday morning, I stopped by Harlequin Studios to warm up before my audition. Harlequin is a deliciously run-down, dingy, brown suite of rehearsal rooms in the heart of the Broadway district. It's up a narrow set of sagging stairs, right next door to a gay porn theater. Take the wrong flight of stairs, and you're in for a very different experience. The linoleum tiles, those that remained, were probably installed in 1960 and approximate a Harlequin pattern. There are signed eight by 10 glossies of long dead stars on the walls, a candy machine which hasn't worked since the 70s, and the ever-present aroma of cigarettes and coffee. In short, it is seedy, vintage, New York theater heaven. I'd warmed up at Harlequin before each of my three auditions for the producers. They know me there. Larry, behind the desk, gave me a smile and a wave. Hey, producers, right? Whatever happened with that? I got it. Good for you. You want room 2B again? Sure, it's my good luck charm. 2B is disgusting, and I love every ugly inch of it. I didn't have to work very hard at warming up for this one. The role was written for Harvey Firestein, uh, he of the gravel-voiced basso, so everything is very low. In fact, I had to warm down. And then it was time. I walked over to the audition studio, and I got settled. As I waited to go into the room... I began to reminisce. I had my first real Broadway audition to be a possible replacement for the role of Epstein in Neil Simon's Biloxi Blues when I was 23 years old. I'd been to open calls before where I'd waited in line for hours with the hundreds of other hopefuls just to sing a few bars of music for an assistant casting assistant, but this was a real appointment at the actual theater for the director himself. I got that appointment using good old-fashioned Broadway moxie. At a friend's insistence, I'd summoned all my young courage, knocked at the stage door, and handed my picture resume to the doorman, saying, the casting director is expecting this. A few days later, to my stunned amazement, they phoned and scheduled me to come in and read. And so I found myself backstage at the very theater where I'd seen the play only the night before for research, Gawking at the set I'd seen from my mezzanine seat, blind with nerves, completely intimidated, wondering how anyone manages to ever do a decent job at these things. I paced. I smoked. I ran over the big speech in my head, and then they called my name, like it was my turn to be executed. I walked out onto that huge expanse of a Broadway stage, shaking script pages in my hand. I was a mess. The stage lights were in my eyes. But from the vast darkness of the house, I heard a warm, disarmingly friendly male voice. Hi, Michael. 
Are you all set? Yes, yes. Any questions about the material? No. Okay, then. Let's start with the second scene. Uh, okay, okay, okay. I turned to begin the scene. The voice interrupted one last time. Michael? Yes? Breathe. I hope one day to know who that man was because I'd like to thank him. That reminder has stayed with me throughout my auditioning career. Since then, fortunately, I've gotten much better at the whole process. Michael? Yes? I stirred from my reverie. Hairspray's casting director was calling my name. We're ready for you. It was my turn. I went in, all smiles and barely nervous. It's always easier when you have a job already. And met the people for whom I'd be auditioning. We had a great time. I, I did my best to put them at ease, which I've learned is crucial. Take care of them, don't make them take care of you. And they had me sing several songs and read several scenes, which is always a good sign. And I made them laugh a lot, which I love. I even remember to breathe. It's always great to see how far you've come. So that was my jam-packed Broadway adventure. <laughs> kind of like a mini showbiz fairy tale. I headed back to Les Miserables, happy as a clam. In just a few days, we'd be making our way to Boston. We could hardly wait. Meanwhile, there were cadets to entertain, and I felt newly inspired to make those motherfuckers clap long enough to give us that damn blue light. All the best from the road, Kostroff. Next up, Boston. I'll see you for the journey there. Bye.